What's up, peers, and welcome back to the World Crypto Network here for the Understanding Bitcoin Conference in Malta. Uh, we're joined again, as with the last conference, at the Riga Baltic Honey Badger with Larry Bitcoin from Blockstream. What's up? How are you doing? Hi. Thank you for having me. Well, always nice to have you. Um, and we talked last time about the really cool green address and uh, that you are going to rebrand it and, and rework the architecture uh, to Blockstream Green. And you're wearing the shirt already. Uh, it's out now, two weeks later. And <laughs> so, so what was the journey um, and, and what do you learn during uh, getting this up and going? Well, the journey is... Um... We, we, we wanted to rebrand the apps at the same time. So we didn't want to uh, release, uh, you know, the Android apps without releasing the iOS app. And uh, we had some delays, mostly because of iOS, uh, but we took that as an opportunity to improve both apps, uh, to, to improve uh, Android uh, a couple of, uh, you know, steps more. And we're currently working on uh, the desktop version, the, the best, the desktop rebrand. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, it's hard to coordinate. It's uh, always uh, painful to work with Apple and, uh, you know, submission process and review process and um, you know, inclusion in the, in the store. But uh, we made it, so I'm happy. And I, I think Green Address was, was your like, hobby project, right? And you started doing this all by yourself. Um, but now, with now being at uh, Blockstream, how many people are working on it? And, and what is the experience of, of working together on that? Um, I wouldn't entirely say that it was a pet project. It, it, it was uh, something that I thought was uh, needed at the time when uh, I started getting interested in Bitcoin. I started getting interested in 2012 and in 2013, um, I decided to launch Green Address. Um, sorry, you asked me. Uh, um, so how is it to work with the team at Blockstream uh, on this? Right, so it, it, the team used to be very small, right? It was uh, me, me and another person, um, but it was very, very small. Uh, now it's about seven people working on it. We have uh, people that are working on Android, people are working on iOS, people that are working on the backend, the libraries, um, but, you know, um, hardware wallet integration. We, we have uh, more thorough testing than we ever did. Uh, I mean, don't get me wrong, I was testing things, but now we we're more professional about it. Um, so it's great. It has been great. Awesome. Okay. Uh, and so you also mentioned that you're going to, uh, or that you did a complete redesign of the architecture. Uh, so what, what exactly now is the architecture and where is it different from before? Right. So before, um, I mean, the, the, the server side of things hasn't been uh, changed, uh, changed much, but the client side, all the wallet stuff has been uh, redone. Not, I mean, the, the lowest levels, the, the crypto hasn't changed. We were still using LibSecP 256K1. Uh, we're still using Libwally, which uh, we have been using for a number of years now. Um, but now we introduced another layer. We, we introduced uh, what we internally call GDK or Green Development Kit. It's a, it's a small library that uh, we use on both Android and iOS and in the future on desktop. And the idea is that we write code once and uh, we only have to do the, the, the UX part, the, the GUIs, the graphical user interface. Uh, for each platform that we, we want to target. This minimizes uh, the number of issues, the number of errors, the number of bugs. Whenever we fix a, a bug in, in one, it means it's fixed for all of them. And uh, it means we can go faster. Now we can finally you know, push, push hard the pedal and then come out again with, with a bunch of new and uh, advanced features. Okay, that is awesome. And of course, this is a open source library, right? Yes. Um, and do you think that now others will pick up that library? Um, and because it has all of the core functionalities of a wallet, all they need to do, quote unquote, would be the, the GUI, right? The UX. So do you think that this will help other software or wallet developers uh, on, on making better wallets? So at the moment, I think um, that's really only true of people that want to have a multi-sig um, uh, wallet. Uh, together with the Blockstream Green service, because the library is uh, completely dedicated to, to the green service. Unlikely Wally or LibSecP, which are generic and can be used by any wallet, um, this is uh, uh, fairly specific to, uh, to, to Green Address or to Blockstream Green. However, the, the interface of this library is so high level that recently I started experimenting uh, with a friend during a weekend sort of hackathon of uh, um, Basically, instead of talking to the Green Address server or to the Blockstream Green server, um, it only talks to your local Bitcoin Core and no other connection to anything else. And uh, basically, it's a front end to Bitcoin Core. 
uh, just by reusing the same interface. So I think at the moment, only people that are interested in um, having multi-sig with the Bloxham Green service are going to use uh, this library. But in the future, once we have uh, a single sig plus, uh, uh, you know, uh, front end to Bitcoin Core, um, then it's going to be much more useful and uh, ideally becomes, uh, you know, uh, iteratively with improvements, but it becomes uh, a standard interface that people can use um, a little bit like, uh, you know, PSBT is a standard interface for whether, whether it's multi-sig or whether it's a hardware wallet. It's a standard for transactions. Maybe we can have a standard for uh, GUI interactions. Oh, yeah. yeah, that is great, right? And, and standardization and, and best practices are always nice to develop. Um, and so you mentioned now already that Green Address is uh, first and foremost a... Uh, multi-sig wallet. Uh, so it is a two out of two multi-sig where one key is stored on the phone uh, and the other key is stored on the Blockstream server. Yes. Um, and so how, how do you make sure that, there, that the Blockstream server does not sign a fraudulent transaction? Sorry, how do we make sure that the server doesn't... Uh, well, so how do you make sure that when the, or when the wallet communicates with the server that it is actually the user authorizing you to sign that transaction? Right. So first of all, uh, we know it's uh, we know it's the user because they just signed their side of things, but also because of the two-factor authentication. They they can uh, provide uh, this is optional, but uh, it's uh, highly advised. And the idea is that you can provide a, a confirmation that you wanted to authorize this. So it's two factors, right? Um, you mentioned two of two. We do support two of two at the moment. The idea is that if uh, the service disappears for any reason, whether it's downtime, whether um, you know, shut down forever, whatever. Um, we have a mechanism that whenever you receive or send, we, we send you basically uh, time locked uh, transactions that you can, that allows you basically to recover the coins in the future, even if the service is not available. Um, we actually have uh, implemented an improvement over this that doesn't require this email backup. It's uh, based on check sequence verify, CSV. And uh, we already implemented it, we just need to turn it on. However, we were kind of wondering whether it's best to wait for the desktop app also to be available before we turn it on, because the old desktop app, it's not um, aware of, of this new feature. And so if you use both the mobile app and the desktop app, you may find yourself in, in a situation where you can only spend from your mobile if you upgrade to this new model. So I was hoping to wait for the desktop app before we kick it on. And I'm not sure if I mentioned it earlier, but uh, we also have a two of three option where the user has the two keys, the server has one plus the you know, two-factor mechanism. And at no point in time you need the server if you want to send a transaction. Um, that's the normal model, like uh, you use the server uh, to, to co-sign it with the two-factor, but should the server not be available, you can use your two keys immediately to, to spend your coins. Okay, that is awesome. So, so with the two or three model, one key would be on the phone. And then you also mentioned there's a hardware wallet integration. So would the second key from the user be on a hardware wallet? Um, so yes, you said there's three keys. One is on the server. Uh, one is on the user, on the user side. That, that doesn't necessarily mean the device, because it could be on the hardware wallet, which we support. We support Trezor 1 and uh, Ledger uh, Nano S. And uh, we recently uh, finished uh, part of the Trezor T integration, so we're also going to support that. And the third key is a backup key. It's a key that you, you shouldn't really use unless you want to bypass the two-factor process and you, you want to recover your coins. Uh, on a normal path, you wouldn't really use it. it we, we only have a... Um, uh, we have a tool that does recovery, which requires the, your two keys if you want to recover those. Uh, but it's not like a day-to-day -day way of using the wallet. It's more like, oh, uh, I, I want to spend them now. I lost my two-factor. The server is not available. Whatever situation, it allows you to spend them immediately. Oh, okay. And so how would be the workflow of setting this up? Would both of these keys be generated on the phone uh, with the Minomic seeds uh, as backups? And would the, the, the well, third or no, second key uh, be only then on the paper backup? So um, we have multiple options. The... You could have a two of three where the, the app never sees any seed or any mnemonic. So first you do a normal setup of your hardware wallet, whether it's a ledger or a trezor. You just do the normal procedure that they guide you through when you create the seed and secu you know, secure it, back it up correctly. And then as soon as you plug uh, the ledger or trezor into either the Android app or the desktop app, um, the, there is no uh, you know, uh, process. You, you're, you're already inside your, your green address wallet, it will be empty. There is no, you know, uh, really setup until you go and, and want to create a two of three. The two of three uh, has two options. Either generates a new mnemonic for you on the fly, 
which you have to backup, of course. But the other option is, well, I already generated one. I'm only giving you the XPub because that's all you need to generate the addresses and the script and, and whatnot. So there, there is an option such that the, 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 the server has one key and the device and the software never sees any seed or money. It's all either on the hardware or generated offline. And by hardware wallet, by hardware, I mean hardware wallet. Oh yeah, that, that, is, that is really interesting. Um, it's a bit advanced and it's a bit hard because the user will have to you know, create the mnemonic somewhere else and then uh, generate the XPUB and then import the XPUB in, into the app and that will allow them to create the tool tree. It's not too hard, but it's maybe uh, not trivial either. You know? Yeah, but really important, right? Because there's always risk of, of having first and foremost the key on the smartphone itself and then showing the monomic seed in the user interface, right? And uh, so when I was testing green address and, and the beautiful user interface, I wanted to post screenshots of everything to Twitter, uh, but the app would not allow me uh, because, well, that is, of course, a feature, not a bug. Uh, so how secure is this prohibition for uh, taking a screenshot? Or would it still be possible that some malicious software would take a screenshot of the monomic? It's definitely not impossible. The, you know, all it takes is uh, one bug in the operating system that it's the one that prevents uh, screenshots being taken. And uh, if you manage to get, you know, some kind of exploit or root access or in terms of uh, iPhone parlance, uh, jailbreak broken or, or whatever, uh, then, you know, uh, anything software can be hacked and will be hacked. So you, you can't really make assumptions. But the idea is, yes, you shouldn't take screenshots of the, the mnemonic because often enough your phone will upload it to the cloud and that's not really great or, you know, or worse. So, uh, And also just a, a little tiny UX thing that I really appreciated was that uh, it only showed what was it? Yeah, six words at a time uh, at any given uh, display. Uh, so you see the first six words, then you have to press next then you see the second six words and so on. So even if a software would take a screenshot, it would have to take four screenshots in order to get the entire seat. Uh, and I, I guess that's extra redundancy, right? Yeah, it, it's, uh, it's both for extra security, but also to, it, it's kind of a better UX for the user to, to see six at a time next. And, and instead of seeing 24 words, only one, you know, crumb screen and, and remembering which one you wrote last and, Am I, you know, at the seventh or the eighth, and and, go, and so on? So, you know, we we, we hope this should improve uh, the the process and minimize uh, friction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very nice, cool. Um, so yeah, a green address is definitely one of the, uh, or green wallet is definitely one of the uh, cool uh, products here at Liquid. Uh, but of course, you have all uh, at Blockstream, and you have already so much more. Uh, so one thing that I really appreciate is the Explorer, which is a open source Blockstream explorer. Uh, so can you tell us a bit of, of why did you do it uh, and and build this thing, and how is it going so far? It's going really, really well. Um, I'm very happy and excited, and we have a few uh, things, uh, a few ideas that uh, I'm going to discuss uh, briefly later on in terms of roadmap. Uh, we started working on it, I think, in October or November. Um, we wanted to have um, you know, a nice block explorer that worked well with Bitcoin, that represented things the, the right way, uh, that also supported Testnet, and that also supported the Liquid Network. So there was nothing out there that uh, was robust or uh, efficient or, you know, th there are a couple of block explorers out there that are open source, but they, they kind of beat rot a bit. Like they haven't been uh, taken uh, as much care and uh, maybe they don't support FTP2, maybe they don't support some new features, SegWit and whatnot. So the, um, we looked around, we couldn't find anything. We, we I, I had an idea, so uh, the, what we did is we, we took um, one, one project called Electrus. It's a re-implementation in Rust of the Electrum uh, protocol, uh, the Electrum server. Um, and yes, it implements the Electrum client protocol so that you, know, you can connect an Electrum wallet in, to, to this uh, server. It's written in Rust. Rust uh, is a good language for a number of reasons, efficiency, but also security. And... Uh, and, you know, we found that it was really good. So we expanded it to, you know, add indexes to the database so that uh, it could query data faster. Uh, we removed any connection to Bitcoin Core so that um, it would be harder to DOS it. Um, and uh, in general, it came up really quick. Like, I think in a week we had a, a prototype. Um, and maybe I'm lying. It was more like two, three days. Uh, you know, it wasn't perfect, but we had a prototype. And, and then, you know, we expanded it to make sure that... Uh, 
it uh, supported uh, mainly at testnet and liquid but also we heard uh, we received tons of feedback uh, both from uh, hardcore Bitcoiners as well as uh, newbies and, uh, you know, try to accommodate, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the principles, the ideas. Uh, for example, uh, Bitcoin is not account-based. There's no such thing as an address balance. Uh, you, you know, you have a bunch of UTXOs. Those UTXOs have uh, an amount associated with them. And, uh, you know, if you receive them all on a specific uh, address, then perhaps... Uh, your balance is really the sum of the UTX. So, um, but you know, it's a, it's a, uh, historically explorers have haven't been representing this correctly because uh, having hundred bitcoins in, in one UTX or having uh, hundred uh, bitcoins, you know, spread across a million UTX is very different because when you spend them, uh, spending one UTX is relatively cheap. Spending, you know, uh, millions of them, it's uh, is going to be very expensive. So you don't have a hundred; you have much less than that. Yeah, yeah, of course, right. That's uh, that's also a good point. Um, and then, of course, when when using such a block explorer, uh, you also want to see some additional details, uh, and and that is always interesting, right? So you have now with one of the later versions, you show, for example, if it is a SegWit transaction or even a Back32 transaction, and how much it could have saved on fees, for example, or if the transaction overpaid on fees, um, and so, some other cool things. So uh, why why did you include them, and are there other uh, tips and, and uh, security best practices that you want to show? Yes, uh, so we, we did because uh, it, it, it's, uh, it's good for us as developers and uh, I think it's good for all the developers out there. Uh, and it's good for people to realize, uh, oh wait, I'm overspending with my wallet, so maybe I should uh, send an email to my wallet provider and say, hey, how about we, you know, we make some improvements? Um, so the, there's definitely that. And there's, there's a couple of things that we would like to add. Uh, one thing is um, uh, um, fee sniping. I don't know if you've ever heard of the term. Um, explain it. Okay, so when you when you send a Bitcoin transaction, uh, there's a field of the Bitcoin transaction that it's called unlock time. Uh, you can set this uh, field to um, say a block height, and until that block height, uh, nodes won't broadcast your transaction. They 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 consider it invalid. <coughs> But after that block height, you can broadcast it and you can get included in a block. So uh, um, fee anti-sniping is a measure that it's not so important maybe today, but I think it's going to be more and more important in the future, whereby uh, you make sure that your transaction, um, w when you send it, you, you put the latest block height you saw or, or maybe random of the last uh, five or six or ten. And this um, makes sure that the blockchain goes forward. Imagine uh, one day when the, the reward is zero or you know, close to zero and everything comes from fees. So if you imagine a scenario like that, which is really uh, the future of uh, Bitcoin, I think, uh, you will see that um, if another miner just uh, got a block with a lot of fees, maybe I have two options now, mining on top or remining that block with all those transactions because I want those uh, you know, very nice uh, transactions. Uh, at what point will I have an incentive to mine on top versus remining the same block? Uh, well, it's only when once there's enough transaction in the mempool that make it worth going forward. So if you put this um, end lock time on the transaction, it means that uh, I, I, I will start seeing uh, transaction in mempool that cannot go in that block, even if I remind it, can definitely not go in that block because they have a block height uh, higher than, than that, that mined block. So I have to mine on top. I cannot remind the same block you mine. So at some point, you'll have an incentive to go forward R rather than reminding. Imagine if all miners were always reminding the same block and you'll get stuck on that block because that block has so many fees that they, it lures them into reminding it. So yeah, that's uh, one of the things that uh, we have supported in uh, Green uh, for a while and Core was the first one to do it really. And uh, I was thinking the Explorer could um, you know, also tell you if uh, you're doing this one, if your wallet is doing this or not. Uh, which I think is a good practice. Uh, there's a few other things that I would like to do on the Explorer in terms of uh, security and privacy. Uh, for example, you should really never use uh, uh, uncompressed uh, public keys. So if we see one, we could say something about that. Like, what are you doing? Uh, you could save so much. Uh, other things that we could do are, you know, integrating historical data uh, feed prices. So if I'm looking at transaction from um, 2015, I can see, well, um, that was the, the price at that time from that exchange. Uh, so that, that's uh, something I'd like to add. Another thing I'd like to add is um, 
lining information. So there's a gossip protocol, there's, there's, a, there's information that is available if you were there to hear for it, which we could integrate in the Explorer to uh, augment it. Like, you know, that transaction was a channel opening. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. Okay. It's that... public information. It's not like we would, uh, you know, yeah. do anything dodgy, but it, it's, it's uh, extra information that is available anyway. We may as well display it. Oh, awesome. So a bunch of good features coming. Uh, and of course, right, with, with running such a public block explorer, um, users ask you if this transaction is correct and, and does you as Blockstream with, with the server run the full node and then tell the users, um, or you claim at least, that this transaction is indeed included in a block. And that, of course, is, is not perfect on a security-wise or, or on the verification side because the user himself does not verify. Right? Yeah, I don't advise users uh, to use the block, our Block Explorer to do any verification whatsoever. Uh, you know, if you want to look up a transaction, um, you know, when, when you're not at risk of losing money, fair enough. If you're a developer that wants to learn a little bit more about the property of a transaction or, or you know, a block or whatever, Fair enough, but you should really either run your full node, or if you really like the Explorer, run the Explorer on your own hardware. Um, that being said, some people still uh, inevitably will, will use it, which is why we, we added uh, Onion 2, Onion 3, and also um, disabled all logging. That being said, it is running on the cloud, so even if we disable all logging, probably the, the cloud provider has some data. So I really advise users to run their own full node. If they really like the Block Explorer, you know, they can run it in maybe their Bitcoin meetup or maybe at home or so on and so forth. Oh, yeah, they're really awesome. And of course, uh, always with such Block Explorer, make sure that you don't display your IP address. So Tor is a great way, maybe a VPN on top. Um, so yeah, great points there. Uh, and also the really cool thing is that on the test model, so not yet publicly released, uh, but we tinkered around and we actually got Explorer running. Uh, so that is really cool. But uh, there are two different modes that, that you told us that really helped a lot. Uh, because we first tried to run the full Explorer on the model. Uh, and that didn't work. It was too resource intensive. Uh, but then you told us that there is a light mode uh, that removes some of the things. So where's the difference here? And are there a risks of running a light node or a light explorer on your own node? Um, no, there are no risks. Uh, so the, the idea is that the light, no, the light version has less indexes, which means it's much easier to DOS. Mm -hmm. But if you're the only user, you really don't care. So the idea is uh, maybe this works for one, maybe five, maybe 10, maybe even 20 uh, honest people, maybe even hundreds of honest people but it's much easier to DOS. So you shouldn't really expose that to the internet, not even through Tor. Uh, but the version, the full version, the non-light version, that's a little bit better. Like uh, it tries uh, to, to be more, more DOS resistant uh, at the cost of expanded data storage. Okay, and, and so what are the resource requirements for such a, the, the light version? Could it run a Raspberry Pi? Of course, yes, you can. Awesome. Uh, so if you have a Raspberry Pi out there, maybe Raspberry Blitz or the Noddle, of course, uh, maybe stay tuned uh, that we can get that uh, up and running because that would, of course, be great because if you use this really advanced uh, block explorer with all these details that it shows, but you use it on your own full node, well, first of all, you have full verification. Right? So nobody can, can steal from your claim that the transaction is there if it actually is not there. And also, of course, on the privacy side, because no one knows the addresses that you're interested in. And of course, your full node does not keep any locks. Uh, so that is pretty much the best of both worlds. Yeah, I should mention that, um, as you're full aware, we, we, we made a release recently where we added all this nice privacy and efficiency information. Uh, the light mode version is the previous one. So we, don't, we haven't added yet back the light version to the latest version. So to use the light version, you have to be one version behind. But other than that, you have all the other features and everything works the same. And we're probably gonna add back uh, the light version. Oh, okay, perfect, um, really cool. Uh, and so of course, as you mentioned, both for green as well as for Explora, uh, you have integrated Liquid, right? And, and that is the side chain that Blockstream is working on. Uh, and so we've already talked a bit about uh, Liquid here on the World Crypto Network, but could you just give us uh, the recent update on, on what has been going on there? Yes, so uh, Liquid originally was based on an earlier version of Bitcoin Core. Uh, now uh, O18 is uh, just about to come out. Uh, and uh, the stable version is 017X, uh, 0.17.1 precisely, I think. Um, so the liquid version we 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 forked Bitcoin from, sorry, the, the opposite, the, the the version of Bitcoin we forked to to create liquid uh, was an earlier version, and now we recently just rebased to 0.17. Uh, 
uh, and it shouldn't be too hard for us to move quickly to 18 as well, uh, which means that we get all the you know nice goodies and nice uh, both UX and demon improvement that uh, went in in Bitcoin Core. So there's that. Uh, we're planning to add uh, more information about assets on the Explorer, uh, all assets being issued, uh, how many reissuances, and whether the issuance was blinded or not. Because Liquid, you know, um, the, the, the more I, because obviously I wasn't the one inventing it or, or developing most of it. I'm doing, you know, integration work. Uh, but uh, it's only relatively recently, uh, you know, maybe the last year, uh, the last 12 months that I, I learned the you know, I love the features, especially when uh, we were building the Explorer. Uh, I love the features of, of Liquid and uh, it's, it's fascinating, it's very interesting. Uh, the idea that you can do blind editions where nobody can see how much you should. Uh, the idea that you can, um, uh, you know, have uh, an issuance where you cannot reissue or an issuance where multiple people can reissue. The, the, all sorts of uh, combinations. And anyone can create an asset if they want to. Now, whether the asset is going to have any value, you know, Lawrence Coin or whatever, uh, that's a different matter. But, you know, it's a, it's a good place to uh, maybe do a stable coin or maybe do a security or, you know, that sort of thing. Um, how, how about the censorship resistant aspect of Liquid? So can the Federation stop as assets from being created? They can't. Um, I mean, everything is possible again, but no, the, the, the whole system is designed such that uh, while the Federation members are running the, the hardware, uh, we call them functionaries, <coughs> you know, that allows to keep the network running and that uh, signs uh, pegins and pegouts and, and that deals with, uh, you know, uh, transactions, it's, uh, it's not really accessible or... The, 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 function, the, the members don't really interact with this machine. It's, uh, it has an HSM inside and uh, everything is happening inside the HSM in terms of uh, keys and they're kind of blind to it. Like the, the, the other thing is that um, maybe they can, uh, you know, I can do a blind edition so they wouldn't know what I issued and then I can do a, 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 a CT transaction, so a confidential transaction where they don't know the amount or the asset I'm sending. So at that point, you know, what are you going to censor? You don't know what I'm doing. Yeah, right. If there is no attribution of who has done what, then how are you going to enforce any reaction on top of that? Right? So that is the awesomeness of, of strong privacy, is that censorship becomes near impossible. Um, yes, but I wouldn't call, um, you know, while Bitcoin is censorship resistant, Liquid isn't. Liquid is designed, um, you know, like to be a, a fast highway for exchanges, traders, uh, for you know institutions or anyone that wants those are the main target right but then it's open so if anyone wants to try to connect to it and, and download the chain and maybe create an asset or peg in some coins keep in mind that uh, anyone can peg in but uh, to peg out so to move coins from liquid back to Bitcoin only the Federation can do it or anyone that they, the Federation decides uh, to allow so keep that in mind if you ever decide to do pegging you cannot peg out unless you go through one of the exchanges Okay, cool. And so what was the feedback from these exchanges? Uh, how do they like this new platform so far? And uh, where do you see the, the, well, the usage and the adoption? How, how many uh, are already using it? And where do you think it's going to go in the future? So um, as far as I'm, we have 15 functions right now and we have a waiting list for others. Uh, I spoke to some of the exchanges that integrated it and they told me that they really liked that it was like Bitcoin. It's exactly the same as Bitcoin. There's a couple of new RPC that we had to create for you know, issuing a, uh, an asset and blinding amounts and that, that, that sort of thing. But otherwise, they're very familiar with it because it's exactly Bitcoin core for it. So uh, that was one good feedback we received. Um, and uh, well, basically people didn't know until they went and implemented against it how many features and how cool it was so people got excited people got excited that you can uh, you know it's trivial to issue it's like uh, create an asset and, and 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 a number and you created it it's done it's uh, you know you can do it from either the comma line or the the debug window inside the you know like bitcoin core has a debug window liquid core has this, uh, the same debug window so you can issue an asset like that it's fairly trivial Okay, awesome. And so if an exchange wants to work with Liquid, do they have to be a functionary or can they just be a quote-unquote regular user? 
uh, they could uh, be just a regular user. There's no nothing preventing them. But then they're not part of the federation, so they're trusting the federation. Uh, if you know, if you're a member, then you feel a little bit more comfortable that you're part of it, and uh, and also you have better connectivity because uh, if you're a function, you're connected directly to the federation. You you are the federation, really. Uh, but uh, everyone else, uh, like the Explorer, for example, or Green Address, doesn't talk directly to the function. It talks to some bridge nodes that talk to the functions. It's, uh, it, you know, it, it's not like mining where it's completely peer-to-peer -peer and anyone can come up and down and disappear and reappear at any point in time. L Liquid has a, a, you know, a fixed number of uh, you know, uh, federates. And it's a little bit, if you compare it to miners, it, it, it's, as if, it, it's as if the miners were signing blocks and uh, they don't change. It's not like it's a different miner this time and uh, maybe it's slash pool, maybe it's this other one. No, it's always the same guys. Um, and, and I would say that it's, it's well, in the case of, of mining, the importance of having this, this liquid uh, group of, of miners that can change at any time, this dynamic member set, is extremely important because mining is part, or a part of mining is the issuance of new Bitcoin. And so if you would have a fixed set of miners, then this would mean that they would be the sole beneficiary of the Cantillon effect of, reach, of, or of acquiring this new money first. And thus, these, uh, these set federation of Bitcoin miners then would be at a great benefit. Um, but it wouldn't be censorship resistant at that point, right? Exactly. They, can, they can stop you if they don't like your transaction. Yeah, th that as well, right? So not only do they get more money, but they also can censor you. So that would be horrible, right? But for uh, liquid Bitcoin or, or for liquid itself, uh, first and foremost, you don't issue a new currency, no. right? So there, there is no one receiving new money first. And so the Kantian effect does not apply at all. Um, and then again, the, the censorship is going to be a bit tricky uh, because but it's it is still entirely possible. Like they, they don't, they have the hardware, but it's not like they, they don't control it. Like um, that being said, if uh, you know they spent a lot of money trying to reverse engineer it, and 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 if all the members colluded, then they could definitely censor you. So liquid is not censorship resistant in that sense. I want to make that clear. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> there was. Uh, what was the one tweet? Yes, uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, you know, we, we call it the marketing intern. He he made a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> he was focused on making hats, uh, and that's of course very I'm important. I'm not even sure who made the mistake, but uh, <laughs> there was definitely a mistake there. Yeah. Uh, well, but right, that also shows how vigilant Bitcoiners are, right? Uh, and rightfully so. Um, absolutely. Um, Okay, very cool. Uh, so we've talked about Green, uh, we've talked about Explora and Liquid. Of course, there are a bunch of other projects still going on with uh, Blockstream. What are you more the most excited about? Oh, it's hard to say. It's really hard to say. Well, I am very excited about Lightning. I'm, I really like what we're doing with Satellite. Um, I can't wait to integrate Lightning in uh, both Green and Explorer, like more information on the Explorer and proper integration in Green. Um, yeah, those, those things are things I'm very excited about. Uh, I, we mentioned that we have liquid integration in green. Uh, we have that, but we haven't launched it yet. So we, we need to finalize it and finish it. Uh, again, I was hoping to have the desktop app available as well, because uh, ultimately I think um, for liquid is more important to have the desktop app. While Bitcoin users tend to use mobile more than desktop, I think traders tend to use desktop more than mobile. And because liquid is targeted to traders, that's like, you know, the one I would like to offer first or, you know, uh, have at lunch. Yeah, awesome. Um, are there any plans of having a Lightning Network on top of Liquid? Yes, uh, we, um, we're we experimenting with it. We, we're making some changes to C-Lining to... So C-Lining already uses Libwally and Libwally already supports Liquid. So uh, Christian Decker recently uh, did a PR to update to the latest version of Libwally and to basically make it compatible with both Bitcoin and Liquid at the same time. Um, still early days because it's like... Uh, um, I don't know. Did you see the um, the satellite instructions that Grubles uh, posted at some point? Yeah. It's a little bit like that. It, it, you will need to compile some things, maybe different flags, maybe because um, you're going to be the only node, or you know, there's, you're not going to be able to find the other ones. Maybe so you can create a, a small network of lining if you want to, but um, at the moment, the, you know, it, it's just to experiment. It's not like it's uh, needed yet. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, well, so we've talked about a bunch of stuff. Um, do you have any last words uh, for the peers out there? Um, well, I'm uh, planning to integrate Tor in uh, all of our apps by default, um, and without uh, on Android without Orbot, on iOS without anything because uh, there is no Orbot anyway. 
um, which will uh, will be optional, but it will be available and on by default, and this would be vastly improved uh, privacy. It may uh, degrade it slightly the user experience because uh, Tor connections tend to take a little bit longer to be established, but uh, I think it's worthwhile. So we're gonna do it, and 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 again, optional. So if the user wants to toggle Tor off, they can do that. Yeah, awesome. Privacy by default is the way to go uh, because if you don't want privacy, then you should explicitly state that, uh, and it it should be really hidden in in the in the settings somewhere so that it's not easy uh, to well, break your privacy just by being a unknown like an unknown user. So, um, yeah. Awesome. Uh, well, uh, and of course, right. Uh, so the, the lizard people uh, at Blockstream uh, do do a great work. Uh, but I'm I'm really confused because, of course, uh, the green wallet. I mean, green lizard skin is green, right? It's really obvious uh, that 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 they have developed that. But but why is is the naming of these other projects uh, not uh, tied to your real identity as lizard people? We we chat about liquid and uh, lining and whatnot. Uh, I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to answer this. <laughs> uh, well, of course, uh, the, the blockstream lizard people uh, do great work, uh, and are really uh, proud and, and thankful that that you built this all up uh, because, well, it's, it's like outstanding all the work you do. Uh, so, thank you very much uh, to you and all the team, uh, and yeah, keep it up. Cheers. Yeah, and Pierce, see you on the next show. Bye bye. Bye.